Well, go ahead and have a seat. Welcome back to Village Church, uh, either online or for the brave, in person. Uh, I'm so thankful and grateful to see each and every one of you this morning. It is a lot more fun to preach with people in the room than just a stupid camera. Uh, I'm really glad we were able to do that for everyone, but it wasn't as pleasant as this is. I, I've been enjoying myself this morning. Uh, you know, Psalm 122 one says, you know, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. And then the Bible teaches us that in the context of uh, believing the gospel, that we uh, have the presence of God with us always, but it also tells us that when we come together physically to worship corporately, that God does something special. His spirit moves in our lives, disciples us, uh, teaches us things that we would not have otherwise. And so because of that, I am so grateful that we now have the opportunity to come together physically a little bit differently. You know, you guys are six foot warriors, so I'm really proud of you. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm just glad to be here with you. And we've been going through this series on the ethos. Oh, before I go on, I do have to welcome Tyler's mustache. I mean, that was, that, was, that alone was a reason to rejoice. Uh, I almost forgot, man, uh, but I went three for three. That's good, right? That's good. Yeah, we got a good laugh. We're a good team. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to your hair. But um, uh, I'm so, we're in the middle really, or kind of winding down a series on the ethos of resurrection. And what that simply means is, is talking about the culture that Jesus created through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about culture, we have to talk about characteristics of what that is and what the gospel does and what the resurrection and giving us new life does is it gives us characteristics that people outside of the church can maybe experience to a small degree, but they can never hope to reach the potential. They can never hope to reach in fullness what followers of Jesus Christ can experience and what it means to be sent as followers of Jesus Christ, what it means to be loved by God, what it means to have hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to have those things, we have to have faith in Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want to talk about what I'm calling the status of new life. And that is just this term, because we've been using a different term every week, rejoice. And that throughout the scriptures, this is a key characteristic that people who knew God, people who enjoyed his redemption, people who knew the life that God had for them, they were able to rejoice in a way that was peculiar in this world. That their lives were filled with this joy that needed an outlet for them to experience in their lives. And this is what is supposed to be really the defining element of every day for a follower of Jesus Christ. And really the reason this is coming after hope is because hope in the future is supposed to dictate our outlook on every day. And so if you do not have the hope of Jesus Christ in your life, then you cannot have this rejoicing that we are going to be talking about this morning. And so I just want to jump into it and talk about what it means to rejoice. So number one this morning, we are meant to rejoice in the Lord. We are meant to rejoice in the Lord. You know, when I was growing up very young, one of the first songs I ever learned was, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And then some woman in the background would go, rejoice, rejoice. And, and so it's not, it's not a great song. It didn't win any awards. But, but it, was, it just had this biblical terminology in it that drove us to understand what does that even mean? Because maybe you've even said it, you know, how are you? Oh, I'm rejoicing in the Lord. But do you know what that actually means? What does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? So to have that, we have to build a foundation for our lives as to who is the Lord. Who is this God that we are meant throughout the book of Psalms and over and over in Scripture? He drives us to rejoice in the Lord. We are rejoicing in the reality that there is a God. And as Francis Schaeffer has said, He is there and He is not silent. He has made himself known. There is a way, Romans 1 tells us, that when you look out into the world on a sunny day, you see the blue sky, you see the sun above, you see the way grass grows, you see the way trees blow in the wind, and you see the way that the world works even in life and humanity itself. There's a designer. 
And the more and more we advance in science, the more and more we learn about the human body, the more and more that we learn about the way children grow in the womb, we learn that there must be more to this than we have answers for. And that more to this is God. That more to this is a God who has designed and a God that we know is above and over everything. And we call that transcendence. That God is transcendent. He is above everything of creation. He's not bound to finitude in the way that we are. He's not bound to time. He's not bound to the same rules of being limited that you and I are, but rather he is in many ways because of his incommunicable attributes. He is above and beyond. He is detached and he is able. But in his transcendence, God has chosen to be profoundly imminent. I mean, think about it. God did not need to create. He's fully sufficient in his own being, but God wanted to. So he chose to create. And in creating, God could have, as many deists falsely believe, he could have spun it in motion, let it go, and stepped away. But he didn't. God has chosen to create and also, in his transcendence, choose imminence. That he's involved. The book of Hebrews says that everything maintains its point because God holds it in his hand. You see, God is involved in creation. He's working in creation. He's keeping everything at the exact levels that it needs to be for us to live and move and have our being. But more than that, God is personally involved in life. There is not a day that goes by where God is not personally involved in every decision, in every breath that I take, in every movement that I make. God has chosen a profound, imminent control in this world, which is amazing considering His omnipotence. It's amazing considering His all-powerful way and the fact that He's all-powerful, He's all-knowing, He's all-good. He is all-able to do each and any thing that He chooses to do, yet... He's here. He's among us. In our gathering, He's involved. His Spirit moves when we read His Word. And when you sit and when you consider such an amazing reality of the implications of all of those things, do you know what that should cause you to do? Rejoice. Rejoice. So when you have that outlook and you sit back and you consider, this is an amazing God, in that moment, you are fulfilling what it means to rejoice in the Lord. Look at what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. It'll be on the screens if you don't have a Bible. Very simple. The Apostle Paul says, rejoice in the Lord when? Always. Again, I will say rejoice. He doubles down on something fascinating. He's saying in each and every circumstance in your life, that's what that always means, rejoice. And then he doubles down. Jesus did this a lot when he was talking to the Pharisees, but he would double down in a negative way. When Jesus would say things, you read the King James English, he says, you know, verily, verily, I say unto you. He's doubling down for emphasis. What the apostle Paul does here, and he uses the same word for rejoice twice, In this saying, he says, you need to rejoice always and again. In other words, you're going to forget it. So remember again, rejoice in each and every circumstance. So how do you do that? I don't know if you've been like me in this uh, way, but I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm not thin. And um, over the quarantine, I have had more time to not be thin. It's fascinating. I don't know if any of your clothes feel as good as they did before the whole quarantine thing popped up, but there's been a lot of Cheez-Its in my house. And here's the interesting thing about Cheez-Its. We've run out of toilet paper, and we're, it, somebody said we're running out of chicken. Uh, we're not running out of Cheez-Its. The, wherever Cheez-It Central is, they've got plenty, and they're selling them to me. And so what's interesting is, is when you think about something that you enjoy, I enjoy Cheez-Its. Maybe you're too snooty for that, but you like them too. You just don't want to admit it. But the key is, is there is a way to enjoy that to where the joy of that moment terminates on itself. And so I just eat the Cheez-It or I eat the ice cream 
or I enjoy the burger, or I like the pizza, and I eat it, and I'm thankful for it. I'm like, man, this is so good. And then as soon as it's gone, what happens? It's over. It's done. The joy is terminated on itself. And so I don't have anything beyond that thing to be thankful for. That is the opposite of what it means to rejoice in the Lord. Even if I take it further and I say, man, the person who made this bowl of ice cream for me, probably my wife, I'm so thankful. That was such a great thing. But the moment she gives it to me, what has that moment done? It's over. It's terminated on itself. There's only one way for joy to continue. And that is if you take whatever that thing that you are finding pleasure in and you continue on to the ultimate source of where that came from. Because we do not have to have ice cream in the way that we have ice cream. I mean, think about it. Somewhere along the line, God gave man the ability to study dairy, sugar, and probably a thousand other chemicals. And then someone figured out, if I freeze them all together at just the right temperature where it's not too hard or too soft, I can have ice cream from Brewster's that tastes like cotton candy. And if you tease it to where it's supposed to go, you can eat that ice cream while you are rejoicing in the Lord that gave us the ability to discover what that means. And that is ultimate. Don't over enjoy your ice cream like I do. But if you do it at the right amount, you can rejoice in the Lord on that moment. And that is exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about. That rejoicing in the Lord means that all of your joy ultimately terminates on God. And that is worship. See, what's interesting about this is that the Apostle Paul wrote this text. And if you look throughout the book of Philippians, Philippians is a book about rejoicing. He says this a couple of times throughout the book. And he's trying to teach the church at Philippi what it is to rejoice in the middle of unpleasant circumstances. See, the Apostle Paul in this moment is in captivity. He's under Roman guard. He is in prison. He is awaiting his execution. And in that moment, he is trying to teach a church that is enjoying something that he can't enjoy what it means to rejoice. See, we think of rejoicing as that which we do in the midst of pleasant circumstances. And the Apostle Paul is trying to teach us a deeper joy that goes beyond the pleasant and can be enjoyed in the middle of suffering. The Old Testament uses the term rejoice more than 267 times. The New Testament uses the term rejoice more than 75 times. And that tells us that through the pages of Scripture from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, that God is seeking to teach us something about the way that we appreciate what is right in front of us, whether it is good or whether it is something that is unpleasant and we would call it bad. Psalm 37, 4 makes the point that finding delight, which is a synonym in the original language for rejoice, And when we find it in God, it reforms the core of who you are and what you want. When he says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, he's not saying that that which you wanted before you were rejoicing in the Lord, he will give you after you rejoice in the Lord. No, he's speaking to your relationship with everything. And he's saying when you find your ultimate delight in God, he will transform your joy. He will change your desire and he will conform it to what God wants. And you will find joy in the very things that God finds joy in. In Psalm 73, 25 through 26, he writes, Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He's saying that there is a way in living life where you can have such rock solid joy that you could lose everything and you would still be rejoicing because you can't lose God. Because you have him. Because you have his presence, you have his promises, you have his work. You have God in your life. Number two, rejoice in your salvation. Rejoice in your salvation. How do we get to enjoy the benefits of God's existence in our lives? Because you say, how do I get there? How do I have that? Well, the only way you can get there and the only way you can have that is if you're saved. 
But here's what's beautiful. You can't save yourself. The same God who is transcendent, the same God who is imminent, the same God who's all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing, all-able, that God also chooses to save. See, in sin, we have detached ourselves from God who is the source of life, but in great love and grace, the same God whom we have sinned against will save if you'll just trust in Him. Because of his love and grace, God saves us from our sin, reconnects us to the source of life. And that, friends, is, of course, something to rejoice in. I mean, if you go from condemned to free, would you not rejoice? But that is what you have in salvation. Psalm 13, 5 proclaims that God's steadfast love gives our hearts a salvation to rejoice in. You think about that. Sometimes we consider the work of God in salvation and we think, oh, he called an audible in the middle of it all and he's like, Jesus, get in there and do something. No, this is something that God has done all throughout history. The work of salvation for God's people is something that God has a history of from Genesis all the way to today. That God's action to bring rejoicing out in his people has always been to save them from harm. And that is exactly what David is talking about in this passage. Then in Psalm 70, verse 4, he says, May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. How does God save? Because he's great. See, so often, if we're posed with the question, how does God save? We almost have this automated response, Jesus But it goes beyond that. It goes beyond who Jesus is to God's great ability. And so when we ask a question, how does God save? The psalmist responds, he saves because he is great. Because he's the God to rejoice in. Because of his power, because of his knowledge, because of his ability to bring about his will in this world. It is God's greatness that brings about man's salvation. How do you think about God? What type of language do you use in your thoughts about God? Maybe your thoughts need salvation even in this moment. Because for many of us, when we think about God, our thoughts about God do not go beyond, God, please do something for me. And that's the totality of our prayer. That's the totality of our thoughts. We have no real language in which when we think about God, we immediately think about greatness. We immediately think about power. We immediately think about goodness and love and grace. We just have a genie who we need to do things for us. Do you have language in which you can rejoice in God? Jesus says something very interesting in the book of Luke when he's talking to his disciples. And he talks about the difference between rejoicing in the benefits that God gives versus enjoying the presence of God itself. In Luke 10, 20, he talks to his disciples and he says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this because it's negative. He says, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, here's the context of what Jesus is talking about. The day before, his disciples did not have the ability to cast out demons. That day, Jesus gave them the ability to cast out demons. And they were walking around like, you know, like a kid at Hogwarts with his new wand. And he's making th- they're making things happen. And they're like, demon, get out. Whoa! And they're rejoicing. They're excited. They say, look at this amazing power Jesus has given us. Look at this amazing gift that God has given into our lives. This is the best to which Jesus says, that's not the right response. Because they were taking their ultimate delight and their rejoicing was terminating on the ability. They were not drawing it all the way back to the source. And when you draw the power all the way back to the source of the power, your rejoicing says, I am so thankful for the God who gave. Do not get too caught up in rejoicing in the gifts that God has given into your life versus rejoicing in the God who gives life. There will always be a tension there. You are meant to enjoy all of the good gifts that God gives you, but it's about perspective. It's about the way that you think. It's about the way that you consider. It's about the way that you look at it. Are you enjoying the gift or are you enjoying the God behind the gift? 
The point is, value God above his gift. In Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul talks about another type of rejoicing, but in this sense, it's in gospel activity. In Colossians 1, he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings. Now, I think that we read that and we say, yeah, that's what, you know, real faith is all about, you know. That's the call to come and die, deny yourself. Uh, and then we get like a hangnail and we're like, why doesn't God love me? I mean, think about how amazing what Paul is saying here. He's saying, I rejoice in my sufferings. Why? For your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Now consider, he's saying two things here. He's saying that his rejoicing in his suffering is first a benefit that he is enjoying because it is filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And sometimes we can get hung up on that and we can say, but Jesus doesn't lack anything. He's not saying Jesus lacks anything. He's saying his perspective lacks something. Because there's something to be left when you look at Jesus and you say, that is great sacrifice, that is great suffering, what great salvation I have because of what Jesus has done. Paul is saying there is a breakthrough moment when you have to personally experience suffering for the gospel. And he's saying, what is happening in me, now I am not just looking at the cross, I am experiencing maybe even a tenth of what happened on the cross. I am experiencing real suffering, therefore my perspective is more mature. But note, it's just not about him. He says, for your sake. And then he says, to build the body, the church. So not only is it giving him a new perspective on the suffering of Jesus, but he's saying that God has brought suffering into his life so that the truth of the gospel would be propelled to more and more people. So he's saying, God is using this unpleasant moment to grow the church. And in that, I rejoice. So often our level of rejoicing is determined by our level of enjoyment. And to that, the Apostle Paul challenges us. And he says, even when you are experiencing that which is unpleasant, you must look to how God is using it. It could be that God is using the hardest moments in your life to refocus you on his gospel could be that the great difficulty that you endure is just what your discipleship needs. It could also be that God is able to use the hardest moments in your life to propel the gospel into the lives of other people. And that is what it looks like to have faith in that God. Rejoice in salvation, both yours and the salvation of other people. Number three this morning, Rejoice in God's providence. Rejoice in God's providence. I love talking about the providence of God because I believe, especially in our current cultural moment, that this, this reflection on the control of God and the ability of God to work history towards His will is something that is often lacking in us in a specific moment where we're like, is God bringing this into my life? Is the devil bringing this into my life? How is this coming into my life? To always be rejoicing is to always believe that God is in control. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 is both an amazing reminder and a ridiculous idea at the same time. It's two simple words. Very, it's very easy. I don't even really need to tease it out. Rejoice always. There's no deeper Greek meaning. There's no deeper meaning to the word always. Well, if you get down to the syntax, the word always, if you split it apart, it actually means... No, it just means always. And rejoice just means rejoice. And it literally means what it says. Rejoice always. And so what does rejoicing always mean? Well, it's an imperative, therefore it's a command. He's saying that in every single circumstance in your life, you have an opportunity to rejoice. And God is telling you that you need to rejoice. And that is so easy for me to say and so difficult in the moment. I do not excel at obeying this command. If it is unpleasant, I want out. If it is not my ideal, it's got to change. And I have a feeling you may be the exact same way. This is an extremely difficult command 
to obey because we are a people addicted to only that which we believe benefits us rather than what God knows will benefit us. When I like the moment, guess what? God is in control. When I don't like the moment, guess what? God is in control. One key point that I think many are ignoring these days is that providence, that that is what our joy must be rooted in, that God is always in control, and that is something that needs our absolute faith. Look at Psalm chapter 5, verse 11 through 12. But, I, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exult in you to exult means that you lift it up for joy, for rejoicing. Verse 12, for you bless the righteous, O Lord, you cover him with favor as with a shield. This was my prayer for our church this morning, that for those who are children of God, for those who believe in Jesus Christ, God is our shield. He is our protector. He is the one that gives deep favor into the lives of his children. And that is the only hope that any of us have. And if he is not in absolute control, then there is no hope in that text. None. The only way you look at that and receive comfort in the power of God is if you say, God both brings that which is pleasant and he brings that which is unpleasant into my life. To which many would say, how can we say that? Consider the alternative. That God brings that which we like and that which we don't like comes from some other source that we don't know of, we aren't told of, and it's wicked. The God of Arminianism is not to be trusted because the God of Arminianism is crippled by our choices, that he is sitting aside and his actions are being determined by my yes and my no, and I either will good or I will bad, but he cannot control the bad. That is no God. The God of Scripture is the God who has complete control over every virus in the history of the world. And he dictates its spread. And he dictates when it goes and when it will receive. That is received. That is the God of Scripture. If you do not believe that, how can you believe in God's absolute control over all things? God is in complete control in every moment of every history. That which I like, God brought it into my life. That which I do not like, guess where it came from? God brought it into my life. To do what? To bring himself glory. That is what Romans 8, 28 says. I take joy in that in a way that a non-believer cannot take joy because I love God, because he has called me according to his purpose. Therefore, everything that comes into my life will turn out for his good. Everything. The greatest evil that has ever happened in the world is the murder of Jesus Christ. That which Acts 2.24 says was according to the divine plan and foreknowledge of God. And if God planned the greatest atrocity that this world has ever seen, I think that he can be trusted to bring in and out of my life whatever he wills so long as it conforms me to the image of his son Jesus Christ. And for so many of us, we piddle around that fact because we are afraid of offending an unbelieving world. The only hope for this world is if they turn from their sin and trust the God who is in absolute control. Coronavirus did not catch God on an off day. COVID-19 kneels to the will of our Father. Years ago, I was at a conference, and I can't remember specifically the person who said it. If I did, I would give them uh, the, the quote. But he was talking about suffering in line with the providence of God. And he made a statement that will stick with me forever. He said that suffering is God's maidservant. And he says when suffering comes into his life, he says, Welcome, slave, do God's bidding. Because that is all the power that suffering has over you and me. It will only serve to accomplish the great glory of our God and King Jesus Christ. 
I'm sure Satan was thrilled the day Jesus died, only to find out it was according to the plan of God because he was going to get up three days later. Though I die, friends, yet will I live. Therefore, I will not fear. I better stop. Trusting in God gives you a north star to follow to guide you through life. Jesus says something profound in the Sermon on the Mount. He says many profound things. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, I love the first half of the sentence. It's filled with victory. That's why I like it. He says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. And I bet the disciples on that day were like, that's what I like to hear, Jesus. But then he said the second half. Do you ever read a verse in the Bible and say, why was the second half necessary, Jesus? You could have just stopped, but you chose to keep talking. It happens to me a lot with my wife. She, she says, you could have stopped, but you just kept talking. And that's how I get myself in trouble. She says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Notice that Jesus says, do you think his will was stopped for one second by the death of the prophets in the Old Testament? By the suffering that Jeremiah endured? By the suffering that Ezekiel endured? By when Elijah ran away? But when Elisha was fearful that he may starve to death, do you think that stopped God's will for even a moment? Jesus stood there and he said, all of those prophets are still alive. They're in glory. He said, rejoice and be glad. Because on the other side of every suffering you've ever seen in the Bible was a great reward in heaven. And when he uses terminology in the original language, when he says things like great reward, he's talking about its immeasurable attribute. And he's saying, I can't affix a material amount to the reward that you will have in heaven because this world cannot contain that level of reward. That is what is available to the follower of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. Philippians 4.4, 4, of course, we read, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Two verses later, here's the outcome, Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The outcome of rejoicing is always going to be more trusting. Here's what happens in my life oftentimes. Something that I do not enjoy happens uh, suffering will enter, a bad choice has been made, something that I don't like has befallen me, and I will sit there and I will get anxious and I will say, i got to come up with a plan. i got to figure this out. Are you like me in that? I think most people are. You're like, all right, got to figure this problem out. To which the Apostle Paul says, what is wrong with you? Why would that be your first response? The older I get, the more I feel like Clark Griswold. If you've ever seen any of the National Lampoon's movies, uh, it's, it's, that, that seems to be what I'm aging towards. Uh, because my, my plans rarely turn out the way that I think they will. I always, and here's, I think it might be a mental problem. 100% of the time, I assume my ideas are perfect. I mean, I just assume. If it's an, if it's an idea I have, it's the best idea ever. Everybody's going to love it. It's going to be the best. And then pretty soon, everything starts falling apart. You know, our, our cats are exploding. I mean, just everything's going crazy. And it's like a National Lampoon's movie. But here's the problem. The father looks to us and he says, don't be anxious about anything. But what does he say? When problems show up in your life, when things are not going the way that you envisioned that they would go, when you trust yourself to come up with the plan of attack immediately, you are trusting in someone that has Clark Griswold's level of control. You are trusting in someone that has no control over his present circumstances or future circumstances. The Apostle Paul says, the faithful reaction of a rejoicing person is with prayer and supplication, first reminding yourself, I'm in the middle of unpleasant circumstances, but thankfully there is a God who saw this happening before it ever happened. And I'm thankful for that. That's what it means to bring thanksgiving into his presence. But then after you give thanksgiving for him existing, you say, God, I need help. And until you go there, your plans are dumb. 
So that's when the planning starts. The planning comes after the praying. That is what it looks like to live a life of rejoicing. I have no control over anything. But have you ever considered that if you don't trust God, you are only trusting yourself? And you are not that trustworthy. How much control do you have over any situation in your life? Number four, rejoice in God's word. Rejoice in God's word. This is where we learn it all. It's transcendent, imminent, all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing, all-able God. Has not only given me enough to where I look outside. I mean, if you have any children, I have three. They're sitting right here. And one of them is really bored. (laughs) Sorry, buddy. But you go to those doctor's appointments, and it is unfathomably amazing how many technological advances we have where childbirth is concerned. The way that you can see these 3D, 17D, whatever it is, sonograms, and the ultrasound where you can just make out the contours of the face, where they can do surgery on a mother's body for birth defects and hearts and things before the child is even born. And in those moments, I have never been more profoundly aware that there is a God than during that process. Science, and this is a fascinating outcome of modernism and the Enlightenment, science sought to disprove God, and science is showing us that it's harder and harder to disprove God because we can't figure out how life works. In those moments, I was amazed at the activity of God But here's the problem. Left to that level of knowledge, that creation and the nature of things screams out his existence, that the birth of my children screams out his existence, the reality of life and love screams out greater meaning that we can't comprehend. None of that will tell me what his name is. It just tells me that he is. tells me that he's out there. But our God is so loving and so gracious. He gave us a book so that I can know his name. He gave us a book so that I can know what he's like. He gave us a book so that I could know what he's done. He gave us a book so that I could see his plan for my life. He gave us a book so that I could know why I exist and what all of this is all about. He gave us his word. And I rejoice in God's decision to tell me what his name is. Do you ever just sit back and consider how amazing that reality is? The God of the universe chose him, chose to reveal himself with the greatest of specificity. He didn't have to do that. Psalm 119 is this amazing chapter of the book of Psalms that goes through the Hebrew alphabet, and much of it is about God's word and God's law. But in Psalm 119, 162, we read, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. What's fascinating is we use the word spoil, of course, that the meat has spoiled, the milk has spoiled. But in this sense, in the original language, what he's saying is, is that X marks the spot on a treasure map. And when you go to X marks the spot, you dig, you find the encasement, you find the trunk, you pull it out, you open it, and the treasure that is inside, that is what spoil is. And he is saying that the word of God is great treasure. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. It doesn't matter what I think about it. It doesn't matter if the verse is like chicken soup for the soul for me in the moment that I need to see it exactly, or if I happen to be having the worst day of my life and my Bible reading plan is smack dab in the middle of the genealogies of Chronicles. It doesn't matter. It is treasure whether I recognize it or not. But do you posture your life in such a way where the word is a great reward for you? where you rejoice just at the mere fact that God has given you his word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, a famous passage. 
The Apostle Paul says, All scriptures breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Look at the terms that Paul uses. What a lot of people don't realize about this passage, it is a passage of rejoicing. Paul is so abundant in what he says about it because he is simply rejoicing in what the Bible is. He's telling you that the Bible is sufficient for everything that you need to build a life worth living. And then if the word completes you, then if you don't have the word, then you can only hope to live a deficient life. Because only the Bible is sufficient to give you the fullness of life. If you want God, you need His Word. If you want to rejoice, you need His Word. We get the treasure of God's Word and we must rejoice in it. But then the great question, of course, is do you cherish God's Word? Do you cherish it? Do you long for it? Do you run after it? If you're a coffee drinker, if you don't drink coffee in the allotted time, you get, you know, the jitters, get a little headache coming on, you're like, oh, I need coffee, and you get a little shaky, you need a little caffeine. Do you ever go in withdrawals from God's Word? Where a day has gone by and you haven't been in the Word, and man, I need the Word. Do you know in the history of the world, the Bible has never been more accessible than it is right now? And I'm not just saying like different translations. I'm talking Greek and Hebrew has never been more attainable to common man than it is right now. Do you live like that? Do you long for it? Do you yearn for it? Over the past few weeks, it has been a treasure of sufficiency for my life. Number five this morning, rejoice in life. Rejoice in life. I think Christians struggle with this. I think Christians struggle to think that we're supposed to enjoy life. What else are you supposed to do with it? God has given it to you. Look at Psalm 118. This is the day what? Who made it? That the Lord has made. I will rejoice, some translations say. But he says, let us. In other words, we must go into rejoicing and gladness because today exists The psalmist is saying in this moment, if you can breathe air right now, you have reason for rejoicing. To which we are in a moment where people are literally responding to ideas like that. And they're like, but what if? But you don't know. But it could. We might. Friends, I might not live past today. But I better rejoice in it if that's true. I better enjoy it while it lasts. I better play while the sun's shining. My mother used to say, sun shining, pigs love slop. I don't know what she was saying about me when she would say that to me. (laughs) But she said it. We must be a people who enjoy life because we have more of it than anyone else. It pains me so much at how miserable some people make Christianity look. The Bible does not give us this idea that Christianity is defined by somberness, asceticism, and denial. When Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, he's not saying, and buckle up, you're going to hate this. No, he's saying that which is sinful, kill it. But once you kill your sin, what do you have? A bevy of righteousness to rejoice in. A life that is finally worth living. Love that is finally worth having. Life. That is as it was designed to be lived by God is a beautiful thing. Parents, the greatest gift you can give your children is not to make them read systematic theology books. The greatest gift you can give your children, I'm convinced where discipleship is concerned, is that they see you laugh. They see you have fun. One of the greatest atheist makers in this world are parents who refuse to let their kids enjoy life. Because they weren't enjoying it. It is a sin to be unhappy. Have joy, laugh, enjoy life. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
more. Does that sound like a drudgery? You know, fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. That doesn't sound very fun, does it? If your version of Christianity is miserable, you're not a Christian. Your version of Christianity needs to have life. It needs to have love. It needs to have happiness. It needs to have joy. It needs to have enjoyment. It needs to have the ability to laugh and love and live and be free. But right now, here's where we are. We are being tempted to believe fear over life. We are being tempted to believe in what might happen over what has happened. And I'll tell you what has happened. We have a God in heaven who has told us to live. We have a God in heaven that has told us we better enjoy life because in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So if anybody's happy, God is happy. So I will, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the way, I will live. I want to give you five application points very quickly. Number one, when it comes to rejoicing, you need to remind yourself to rejoice. You need to remind yourself to rejoice. And you say, why? C.S. Lewis says in his book, The Problem of Pain, he says that happiness can inhabit 10% of our lives. And we can enjoy it. But he says pain, no matter how small, seems to take over all 100%. He says pain is God's megaphone to awaken a deaf world. And so you are more tempted to be filled with pain than you are to be filled with life and rejoicing. Therefore, in the moment of despair, you need to pray, Holy Spirit, remind me to rejoice. Secondly, remind each other. I hope you've learned over the past nine weeks you were not meant to do life alone. You were not meant to live an isolated life. You were meant to be in a relationship with other people. You were meant to have discipleship, discipleship influences from other people. You need it. You were meant for it. You were not meant to do this alone. And if you are in here and you have convinced yourself into isolation, you have convinced yourself into loneliness, I want you to understand that it is a choice you are making. And you need to make better choices. Here's the deal. If you are alone and you don't have anybody in your life to remind you, go to our website, fill out a form for a community group, and we will connect you to people whom will at least, at minimum, remind you to rejoice in the Lord. They might think you're weird because you probably are, but, but they, will, they will remind you to rejoice in the Lord. That's the promise we make. Third, here's the source. Remember God's Word. Remember God's Word. How do you remind yourself? How do you remind each other? The Word of God. Do you know it? Are you constantly in it? Are you saturating your life in the Word of God? Number four, remember to focus. Remember to focus. You will not drift towards joy. You will drift towards pessimism. You will drift towards cynicism. You will drift towards fear. Your default modes tend to be worst case scenarios. But if you will remember the word of God, you will remind yourself to have intentionality. I will focus on that which I have to rejoice in. Friend, if all that you have to rejoice in is the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have more to rejoice in than anyone in this world. Number five, remember to worship. If you do the first four, you will land at five. Does God have your rejoicing? Friend, whatever your heart rejoices in the most is what you are worshiping. Whatever you long for, that is what you are worshiping with your life. You were meant to worship Jesus Christ with your all. That has to maintain your focus. Now, there's two groups of people in here as well as online this morning. The first group of people, you are the type of person who does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have not put your faith in Jesus. Maybe you've been reminded this morning that joy is something that you want, you didn't think you could have it, or you're realizing that you don't have it. You can have the joy of the Lord. You can rejoice in the Lord this morning if you will turn from your sin and you will trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. In this moment, pray these words. Jesus, I believe you. Please save me from my sin. Jesus, I believe you. Please save me from my sin. Now, friend, I'll tell you, that's just the beginning of a longer conversation that you probably need to have with God. But if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, he will reconcile you to himself and he will give you life eternal. But maybe you're in here and you are a follower of Jesus Christ and 
You're like me, and you just constantly need reminders to have joy. You just constantly need reminders like me to rejoice in the Lord. Here's the deal. We're going to do communion a little differently for the followers of Jesus. And the seat back in front of you should be a little communion uh, packet. It's a disposable little packet that was hygienically placed there earlier by someone following all sorts of protocols. Uh, If you will, just in a moment, peel back the top, your bread will be there. And then if you peel back the bottom, that is your cup. The bread represents the broken body of Christ. The cup represents his shed blood. When you eat and when you drink, you proclaim to everyone in this room, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, even if this is your first time with us, eat, drink, profess your faith to everyone. But if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've not trusted in him, please refrain. When you're ready, eat and drink.